In the early 70s, OPEC didn't like what we were doing in Israel. Same old story. And so they cut off our oil supplies. So some of you will remember these long lines at the gas stations. And we feared we were going to have another depression, like the 1929 depression. And so the U.S. Treasury Department came to me and other economic hitmen and said, listen, you know, we can't allow OPEC to blackmail us anymore. You guys got to come up with a plan so this will never happen again. We knew that that plan had to involve Saudi Arabia because it had more oil than anybody else. And it also, the House of Saud, the royal family, was corrupt and corruptible. The long version is explained in the book, but the short version of what the, we did, the deal we finally struck with the House of Saud, was a deal whereby they would return almost all the money they made from selling oil to the United States invested in U.S. government securities. The U.S. Treasury Department would use the interest from those securities, which over the years has amounted to trillions of dollars, to hire U.S. companies to westernize Saudi Arabia build petrochemical complexes, desalinization plants, whole cities out of the desert, McDonald's and all the other things that go along with our Western culture. The House of Saud would also agree to keep the price of oil within limits acceptable to the oil companies, possibly not acceptable to you and me, but acceptable to the oil companies. And this is very, very important. They, would, they agree that they would never, ever sell oil for anything other than U.S. dollars. This happened in the early 70s, right after we'd gone off the gold standard because we were bankrupt, because we could not pay off our debts to European countries in gold. Nixon took us off the gold standard. And then we were stuck with a situation as why will anybody in the world use dollars? So very shortly we came up with this plan, which in essence made put the, put the dollar on the oil standard. You cannot buy oil on the world market for anything other than dollars. And that's very important to the corporatocracy. We, our part of the bargain was we agreed to keep the House of Saud in power, in control. It was an amazing deal, the deal of the century. It was history making, incredibly powerful deal that we struck with Saudi Arabia. And it's held. It's had some what the CIA calls blowback unintended consequences. For example, one of the things that really pisses Osama bin Laden off is those McDonald's and those desalinization plants and those petrochemical complexes surrounding Medina and Mecca, the two most sacred sites in Islam. And it pisses off a lot of other Muslims in Indonesia and all over the world. There's been some blowback, but on the whole, the corporatocracy looked at this as an incredible success. I had done my job. We economic hitmen did a great job with that one. So we decided that Saddam Hussein ought to accept something very similar. Now probably a lot of you know that Saddam has been our boy for a very, very long time. Uh, you may remember uh, Abdul Karim Qasim, who was president of Iraq in the early 60s. Qasim came up with a unique concept. He said, Iraqi oil ought to go to benefit the Iraqi people. How novel is that? But we didn't like that very much. He began to tax the oil companies, particularly the British and some American companies, and threaten to nationalize our oil companies. And so we decided that Qasim had to go. We, the CIA sent an assassination team. It was headed by a man who was still going through high school, an Iraqi citizen who was still going through high school. Uh, they, uh, they riddled Qasim's car with bullets on the streets of Baghdad and missed him. The head of this assassination team was wounded and fled to Syria. His name was Saddam Hussein. He was a CIA agent in those days, an assassin for us. He failed. And so the CIA went directly, and this is all history, I'm not creating this. CIA went in and had Qasim publicly executed on Iraqi television. They put Saddam's cousin in charge. He became president of Iraq, and Saddam became vice president in charge of security. Eventually, as you know, he became president. He was our boy. He was our man. And so 
in the and we sold him a lot of and gave him a lot of tanks. We built him Bechtel, built him big chemical. I don't know. My father-in-law was chief chief architect at Bechtel, built Saddam big chemical plants that were used, and we knew that they were used to make mustard gas and other chemical weapons that were being employed against the Kurds and later the Iranians. We knew this, but we sold him these things. And in the 1980s, we decided that Saddam Hussein ought to accept something similar to Saudi Arabia, such a successful deal. Because after all, what we want to do is control the Middle East and control the oil in the Middle East. And incidentally, I'm going to get back to Iraq in just a moment. But for those of you who think that Israel is about creating a homeland for the Jewish people, you're as deceived as most of them are. It's partly about that, perhaps, but what it's really about is creating a surrogate fortress in the middle of the Middle East. The Israelis are being used as pawns. They're being used like old armies used to use sheep that ran before the armies. There are surrogates, and their leadership knows that. Most Israelis probably don't. They think they're creating a homeland. But it's a very, very sad situation of what's going on there. And of course, the Lebanese and the Palestinians are caught in the middle of this. And Iraq is part of that, too. We have to remember that Middle Eastern oil is the oil that's used by a great deal of Europe, and China, and Japan. If we control Middle Eastern oil, we control our biggest potential competitors, Japan, China, Europe. 